So welcome everybody to HBST Book Talk, which is a serious, uh, long defunct series of book talks on books concerned with uh, history of science in Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. Uh, we started it in the pandemic and then uh, as the time and Zoom activities progressed, we kind of stopped it because people uh, didn't show up and we we're very happy first that we would uh, kind of resume the session, the the, the section, the series with, with, with Victor's uh, very nice uh, book, which, which is uh, also very popular because it's like visible that, you know, when we stopped the, the presentation, the book talks, we had like five people coming and now we have 15. Uh, so, you know, uh, we know that we are talking about an important book uh, and I'm very happy that veteran uh, will be uh, commenting on it. Uh, and without further ado, I will then uh, give the floor to uh, Victor for the presentation. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, thank you and thank you for waiting. Um... I'll try and share screen. Maybe I have a little few slides. Um, let's see. Uh, can you see this? Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Victor, and this book uh, came out of my dissertation, uh, and was obviously just the re the main reason to write it was just to be able to use this picture as a as a cover. Uh, which I think sums up quite well a lot of the things I want to talk about in this book, which is um, computers, of course, but I originally am not a computer historian by training, uh, and my ideas really stemmed from my idea of how socialist states modernize and how backward states modernize in general. Um, in many ways, I think the best way to summarize it is from this slide. I hope the slides are moving as well. Um, in 1981, at the, this moment when Bulgaria had already been undergoing 35 years of uh, socialist modernization, it launched as part of its this grand 1300 year anniversary of the state um, celebrations, which were like extremely big and extremely well funded. As part of this, to show it's also not just a cultural nation, but a scientifically advanced nation, it sent its own first domestically designed satellite up into space on a Soviet Vostok rocket as part of this intercosmos space cooperation program. And this Intercosmos 22 satellite, called Bulgaria 1300 as well, basically was full of quite advanced instruments. And importantly, it sent and recorded information uh, on computers in the Soviet program, which sometimes were designed and made in Bulgaria, but definitely were using Bulgarian hard drives. In many ways, that is like the story of the book. Um, when Bulgaria, when the Bulgarian Communist Party took over in 1944, the late 40s, uh, Bulgaria was still seen as one of these perennial cases of underdevelopment in Eastern Europe. Uh, people like Paul Rosenstein Rudan and other fathers of international development theory really tried out and wrote about places like the Balkans and Eastern Europe, as many of you are aware. Um, but by obviously the 70s and 80s, Bulgaria was becoming the biggest producer of electronics in the Eastern Bloc when um, trade shares are shown, were seen, and export shares are seen, uh, and an almost monopoly producer of hard drives and hard disks, which, as banal as it sounds, uh, is, of course, the golden goose cow in a time when centrally planned economies and this vast militaries and scientific establishments are producing tons of knowledge, tons of information and data that need to be recorded. But, of course, hard drives were in the 7 to 29 megabyte range. So really, these two pictures also co cover the story of what this book was written about. Uh, it's a story of modernization and why computers were chosen by this small Balkan state as part of this uh, modernization drive, but also really... Um, how they impacted not just the economics of this country, but really by the end, I think some of its intellectual, political, social, cultural, philosophical, uh, and other dimensions, as you can see in many ways, I'm very non-ambitious in writing, uh, like almost uh, an attempt to write some kind of like um, total history of <laughs> late socialism, uh, or maybe it's just born from the idea that I get bored easily. Uh, but the other thing really why I wrote this book is because even as a child, in the 90s, uh, you hear a lot of these myths around you in Bulgaria, and also you experience a lot of lived narratives. And I think it's important for historians, as scholars, to also note our personal stakes and personal uh, trajectories of how we get to places. Already as a child, um, I had heard these stories around the dinner table. The Bulgarians like to tell themselves and tell each other that the computer was created by a Bulgarian, uh, by a guy called John Atanasov. And of course, we should be very proud of that. And of course, when I'm a child, when you're a child and you hear someone 
you believe and you trust like your parents said, uh, you believe it, but also, you know, the name sounds Bulgarian. And Jonathan Asov himself is an American professor of physics who is born to a Bulgarian father and an Irish mother uh, in Canada, I think, or I'm sorry, state, upstate New York. And he generally is considered one of the important figures in computer history in the 1930s and 40s, together with his uh, graduate student in Iowa State University, Clifford Berry. They managed to create a computer one, some that's that in the 50s uh, was kind of recognized uh, in these um, in this like um, trials uh, and court decisions against ENIAC. ENIAC is the first universal programmable computer made in 1945. And people who participated in maybe creating the idea of computing or different components of computers which ENIAC might have used kind of sued them. Jonathan Asov himself really does became only famous for Bulgarian science in the 70s during socialism, which is when he discovered his Bulgarianness in many ways. He was invited to the country, got the medals, etc. So in that way, computers already baked, I think, into Bulgarian national identity, especially 20th century Bulgarian national identity, uh, when the state, like many other small states, might sometimes suffer from certain uh, uh, ideas that it's too small to matter, figures like this, who probably did not consider themselves Bulgarian ever, even once they got given medals by the socialist state, uh, where it became important in this narrative. The other idea is that, of course, in the 90s, so the deindustrialization of Eastern Europe, in general and Bulgaria in particular, and thousands and tens of thousands of engineers and people who worked in high-tech industries like electronics either got laid off or made a transition to the capitalist economy in different ways, and that's a real part of the book. And some of these transitions were emigration, of course. Bulgaria is one of the most brain-drained and emigre countries in Europe. Uh, and one of the emigres by the late 90s was my own father, who was working on a PhD in artificial intelligence, or expert systems, as it was really called, um, in the late 80s in Bulgaria. But, but with the fall of communism, he never completed it, and instead started on his software firms, which eventually made him and my whole family move to the UK. Uh, and even though I was never really interested in this and I hated computers and I think I still hate computing, I can't really program anything. Um, I think it's important to note these things because in some ways this book probably is born out of a certain idea of why did people like my father move and why did so many families, not just mine, end up in the places they did. Um, but of course the book is also trying to intervene in different histories. And I think there's a number of histories which I try to intervene in or, or I'm definitely drawing on and sometimes it gets a bit unwieldy, I know that, maybe makes it harder to read. But there's a few. First of all, of course, there's the Balkan history and Bulgarian history in particular, and more specifically, commodity history, um, and how one commodity, because obviously the computer is a commodity, as well as a tool, at least in the first half of this book. Um, how can you tell the story of a country through a commodity? I'm really interested in the way that Mary Newberger told this story about 10 years ago using tobacco, another golden cash cow of the Bulgarian, uh, Bulgarian, the Bulgarian economy to really tell a very long durée story of Bulga independent Bulgaria. In many ways, I think the title of my book is a nod to this. However, also there's a burgeoning literature on socialism going global um, and not just Bulgaria. And I'm here mostly going to draw mention two books, the new book by Teodora Dragustinova, which shows how the long 1970s, as she calls them, where this moment when a small state like Bulgaria explodes into the international diplomatic scene, precisely around this 1400th anniversary celebrations, where a very concerted state effort can lead to a country punching above its weight in, in the Cold War. And this is really a way to take, this is a call to take these small states seriously uh, at what they do and how they present themselves, but also what they do in the, in the Cold War scene. And maybe the Cold War actually looks like a field of possibility if you're not based in Washington and Moscow, because I think in some ways, Washington and Moscow are actually but often constrained by their, by their uh, even though they're the most powerful states, are constrained by their um, geopolitical struggle. And certain of these states, even though they're supposed to be the most loyal allies, as Bulgaria was supposed to be, could actually operate in certain ways. Eredo Mihili shows this very well. And I think Eredo Mihili's book on socialist Albania, and even smaller socialist states, kind of like really points out how also we should, we should take the Eastern Bloc and the Second World as really a serious modernization attempt, an alternative modernity, which tried to build something very different and also created shared material and economic space. And the Bulgarian computer cannot be understood without taking the Comic-Con, you know, the Eastern Bloc's economic organization seriously as something that's worked in a certain way. Um, so yeah, the, the Frankie Goes to Hollywood is just this kind of uh, idea to move away, of course, from also looking at the Cold War for just the prism of Moscow, your Moscow's, your Washington's, your London's, your Beijing's. Uh, and of course, there's computer history and I'm not so 
deep into you know what new hard drive was created, but I'm more interested in precisely this kind of applications of computers, applications of computers to novel economic ideas that have been written about in different ways and how computers could be harnessed to different uh, political projects. People like Benjamin Peters have written about the Soviet internet, OGAS, and how it's this dream of automating or accounting and the national planning in the Soviet Union. But people like uh, Aidan Medina have also written about CyberSyn, this Chilean project of the 70s um, during the short-lived Allende government, where again, the national economy was supposed to be run mostly by from these seven chairs based on Star Trek. Um, uh, and this was obviously a, 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 this book, Cybernetic Revolutionaries, that came over 10 years ago is another very powerful um, influence on me on how to, to tell stories about politics and philosophy and social change for computers. So this is the background, and because uh, I'm already late, I'm going to try and run through the book in some way, just give you the bare bones of what the book is trying to do, uh, and maybe I can like expand more depending on the comments and questions, because there's about seven chapters, and they reach from the economics and why this econom economic sector was created and how it was created to its operations in Comic-Con to more like, let's say, its political, philosophical, and labor implications. Just in the bare facts are... In terms of profits, it was one of them. It was the most profitable in terms of value added part of the Bulgarian economy. Um, by eighteen the mid eighties, it was producing as I said nearly half of the electronic block eastern trade. It was noticed by the CIA. It was noticed by the Spiegel. The Spiegel in the eighties even like calculated it was seventy percent, which is obviously I think wrong than really buying some Bulgarian propaganda. It had successes from the fact it was equipping not just offices throughout the eastern bloc, but also things like the Soviet space program, and it was exported to over 50 states around the world. And that's an important part of my case study, um, how this computer was exported and what it did in the global south. Um, it, depending on who is counting and how you count it, this was one of the most important industrial workforce groups. It was definitely the second biggest industrial workforce group in the country. About 180 to 215,000 workers worked in it out of a country of just under 9 million by then. 90s and you know by the the fall of communism this as you know perestroika and the bulgarian perestroika ramped up um some people still even came from the from the usa to have, have a look at exactly what was being created and it's really tied to this man you see here ivan popov who is a very well placed engineer uh with impeccable communist credentials we can talk more about him if you want it's about it's, he's a great figure if you don't want to talk about the contingencies of history right he is the person who, in the late 1950s, when Bulgaria is suffering an economic, its first debt crisis, is taken by the Politburo seriously, and he says Bulgaria needs a cash cow. In there, and it can't industrialize any further, using just you know tomatoes and eggs. Famously, that's what he says. And in a country fairly poor natural resources, very few iron ores, not very good coal, etc. Et human capital is what's needed and what's best to use. And also, the Eastern Bloc is not yet mass producing any of these goods of the future. So if Bulgaria acts now, he says in the late 50s and early 60s, it can kind of leapfrog. It's much more advanced industrial competitors, not just the USSR, but East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, etc. And it's, it's only works really because Ivan Popov and the Politburo become very quickly aware that Comic-Con, after Stalin's death, is going to move towards a actual attempt at division of labor, right? And Comic-Con is obviously just this giant Eastern Bloc um, space of mutual economic cooperation with observer states throughout the world. Um, and after Stalin's death, uh, under Khrushchev, there's attempts and the first steps towards um, creating some kind of mutual uh, division of what's going to be created, as I'm, most of you know, probably. Uh, and by the mid to late 60s, there's actual contracts and quotas given to, if you can win, the, win them, right? Like, so Poland's not, not everybody should create the same kind of good because that is no way to overcome, you know, capitalism in many ways, right? So if one, one can produce optics like East Germany, another is going to specialize in shipbuilding, another state will specialize in computing. And by the late 60s, that is true. Comic-Con decides to go towards what's called the unified systems or AS system of computers, which pretty much every state in the block will create at least one processor. But really the Bulgarians managed to get the golden, as I said, Cow, which is the tapes and the discs. Uh, and um, how that happens, again, is something we can talk a bit about in the questions and answers. But one of the main reasons I would say is that the Bulgarians were, in many ways, the first to exploit a particular 
gap in the armor of the Western embargo. Of course, Western technology is what's key to the story, right? And the computer is invented in the USA and the UK, and it's obviously there are Eastern Bloc developments as well, but if you're gonna catch up, you have to get the most modern technology from somewhere. Um, and the unified system itself kind of supersedes um, supersedes kind of domestic designs and it's supposed to be an IBM compatible machine. It's actually a direct copy of an IBM computer. So this is where, for example, stories like the Japanese story and the Japanese connection to Bulgaria become very important. By the mid 60s, Bulgaria is the first Eastern Bloc state which manages to get a mass production license from a Western company. It's a Japanese company. Fujitsu gives the Bulgarians a license to create a com computer. And most importantly, it's not so much the computer, but the fact that hundreds of Bulgarian engineers get sent in the mid-late 60s to train in its factories in Nagano. Um, and these people have a very important role to play, not just in Bulgarian engineering in the next couple of decades, but also in its high politics. As, well, as by the end, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of like the economic desires of this sector. And a lot of them by the 80s are very well connected to Japan and actually started their careers in Japan. And you get these curiosities, for example, the Balkanton, the Bulgarian like uh, sound recording company would put out these company songs, right? If you know Japanese and South Korean companies have their own company songs, so Fujitsu song is actually pressed on vinyl and, you know, recorded and published basically on the Bulgarian market. Um, so this Japanese connection is one of the main ways the Bulgarians managed to surprise a lot of people in the late 60s in the Eastern Bloc and suddenly like over kind of leap ahead from the fact that from a place where in 1963 they had not a single computer in Bulgaria, and by the late 60s they could offer expertise and mass production, right? And but throughout the 70s and 80s, this ramps up. Uh, they create some of the most well sold economic calculators, which are domestic designs. And then here, is, as you see in the picture of Fujitsu, that's the 1965 first mass produced computer in Bulgaria. And by the late 70s, they're producing the full gamut of ES machines, the unified system machines. In Bulgaria, they're called ISOT. Is always one of these abbreviations that don't mean very much. Um, well, it means something, but it means boring things like, you know, computational organization and recording technology, which is the big conglomerate of Bulgarian factories that creates this. And by the 80s, it's producing PCs, robots, and all kind of like all the goods of the third industrial revolution, right? Um, and this is important because by the 80s, it's starting to produce the things that really automates the workplace in the way it's envisioned by the Politburo, which we can talk about in a little bit. Now the book, of course, chapters three and four, after these first two chapters talk about how it was created, I move towards exactly how you get the information. And of course, it's all good to get the Japanese to sell you licenses, but generally they, you're under an embargo. And I think one of the things that we have not really paid enough attention to is the fact that in Eastern Bloc intelligence services are basically the research arms of a lot of the industries in the Eastern Bloc. Um, this book that you see here, Avkum Zakhov, it's probably the only book that's uh, where a Eastern Bloc agent defeats James Bond, or a very this not very well disguised version of James Bond. Um, this book, I think, goes for thousands of pounds now on on um, Amazon. If you're an aficionado of the Bond uh, franchise, um, it's one of the Bulgarian super spies. But the real Bulgarian super spies uh, basically kind of worked mostly for the computer <laughs> for the computer um, industry. Um, if you look at the files, which are mostly open now. Um, you don't get a lot of files about officers because those were burned in 1991, but you do get a lot of statistical information and you get a ton, a ton of um, information about operations. Victor? Uh, yes? I just wanted to say that we still see the first slide and I suppose- Oh my God, seriously? <laughs> oh, well, let's, let's try again. So if I do this, you've seen still the first slide? No, now we are seeing the Comic-Con. Okay, so it was slide one. That's what that was supposed to be the rocket in international. The yeah, these two. So, right. All right. This is. Do you see the a cover of a book? See now. No, we, we see Comic Con countries. Oh no. Okay, let me just try this from the start. We don't see the presentation. We just uh, see the PowerPoint window. Nothing's moving. Okay. No, nothing is moving. At this oh, well. uh, I mean, I, I you would think that maybe you're working on a Bulgarian computer, but I think it's actually Japanese. Um, anything better now? 
No. We see the pyramids, but it's not moving. So okay. it's the Osaka. All right. Well, I'll just do it. it's there's not there's some interesting pictures, but I'll just have to describe them to you maybe. Um so where were we? We do it with the spy. Um the spies um were a oh my so I wanted to talk a little bit about the intelligence, um the intelligence services. Um the files there, I think, are very important, and I think there's a lot to be done through that um, in more countries. And people have done that on Poland, people have done that on, on East Germany, and hopefully this with Bulgaria as well uh, will help a lot. But um, basically, you see this this it's this scientific technical intelligence arms created in the 60s to service the whole economy and the military. But in the KGB, especially the military, obviously, secrets are extremely important, extremely important part of what is being taken. But um, very quickly by the late 60s, you see the Bulgarians like completely turning towards the service of the civilian economy. And you, until the end of the regimes, you see constant complaints in the files by the KGB that no one is stealing enough military secrets. I think we can talk much more about that, uh, precisely how the smaller states are completely aware that they're under the umbrella, the security umbrella of the Warsaw Pact in Moscow. And in many ways, the technology, the military technology is going to come from there. There's no necessarily need to do much with your own, um, you know, with your own intelligence services. Uh, in chapter four, I move towards um, uh, India. India is my case study of the global south. Uh, this is where Bulgarians learn in many ways how to act like capitalists. Because one of my questions has always been to me, how do you in the late 80s get, get to the transition in Bulgaria and how do how they make capitalism without capitalists? And of course, part of the secret is, of course, that communism already had uh, cores of places and expertise where people act as capitalists already. And the Global South is, of course, a place where um, different kinds of um, economic realities played, right? India is a much more open market until the 70s, where Bulgarians are comp competing with IBM, with Fujitsu itself, with Indian companies, but also actually their socialist competitors. For, like, And in the early days, the Bulgarian embassy really becomes this conduit of uh, criticism and expertise in many ways, right? They're telling Bulgarian enterprises that what they're doing in the Eastern Bloc cannot fly in the Indian market. For example, you know, um, sending um, sending uh, computers with poor aesthetic design, with the manuals and programs written in Russian, you know, so this actually pushes Isot itself to kind of internationalize and start producing products in English, in Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin. And by the 80s, this kind of um, Indian connection and in countries like India pushes off to actually act fairly modern on the global South markets and the world markets. Uh, and I think this is one of the important conduits where the third world is extremely important to meet the first world, right? If the second world is operating under an embargo, the third world should not be seen just as a place where the East tries out development policy to prove that its development um, concepts are better than the West, but it's actually just a place for business practice and not just profit making, but business practices in business negotiation, advertising, marketing, etc. Um, then I finally zoom in to what this meant for Bulgaria itself, because uh, to be honest, um, you know, that's what's most important to me. Um, so I kind of work on the fact that, you know, by the 80s, Bulgaria is producing robots, personal computers, uh, uh, and is creating its own network of systems, uh, which leads to a certain belief and a certain um, boom in both party thinking and um, philosophical thinking. The party is, of course, in many ways trying to do what's happening in the Soviet Union in the 60s and 70s, this attempt to cybernetize the economy. If you know, if you have perfect informational links, central planning li uh, problems will be resolved. You might not need human planners eventually, but also it's to remove what the Bulgarians call the subjective factor in production. Of course, subjective factor in production is a worker. In many ways, the worker is blamed constantly, the Bulgarian worker is blamed for the poor quality of products, etc. And there's obviously in the documents, the robot in the computer set is seen as a much more important worker. Of course, by the 80s, the Bulgarians, of course, are realizing that whatever networks you make, it doesn't destroy the problem of, you know, um, false numbers and reporting false numbers, etc. It's still, you know, the core of the shortage economy. But also the cyberneticians and philosophers start thinking about it, and there's a, just a complete boom in philosophical and technical intellectual thinking that I, I'm happy to much, talk much more about, and I think in some ways are the most interesting parts of the book. Um, this is often connected to human creativity and programs for what computers will bring to the Bulgarian and to the socialist uh, humanity. Um, this idea, for example, as well, that 
Amadeus is not the person that you should copy, it's Salieri, like computers will allow you to be a Salieri, which I think is kind of always the funny, um, funny um, acceptance of mediocrity of Bulgarian socialism. But you know, if Amadeus Mozart is this freak of nature who is a one in a million, one in a billion in nature, you know, kind of endowed him with gifts, but Salieri, as his rival, nearly approached him by breaking music down into his constituent parts, you know, counterpoint, harmony, etc., melody, and learn it in the computers will allow you to like special hyper specialize in these things. Um, this is a massively applied to children and to this boom in 80s education in computers, um, but also I think has interesting responses, interesting effects on labor. And I, I, there's examples of ludism and, and problems with um, the impl implementation of automation. I'm just going to use one example from, that came out of one of my interviews, two of my interviews, and some files. The automation, the first automated mine in Bulgaria in the 1970s, and the team that created it kind of, you know, this replaced the whole dispatch team of a central computer and uh, certain radio relay stations in this giant copper mine in Medet. And then they, very quickly, this, this system stopped working. So when they went and saw that a lot of the radio relays were knocked over by the trucks, they investigated and, of course, realized that the computer had replaced a lot of personal uh, and patronage networks within uh, the mine. So actually, they send an engineer to the military factories and they armor the radio relays and the automation system works perfectly. And there's got a couple of examples like this, but I think a lot more has to be done here on the labor implications of computing, not just in, uh, in the West, but obviously in Eastern Bloc history. Um, there's bits that I can only mention and the files only go so far and I thought the book was really reaching too much, too far, but there's gaps which I'm very much aware of. One of this is the genderized aspect for example, the fact is, of course, the mo main major the majority of the people who work on the conveyor belts were women. When you look at the files and the pictures and the advertising, women are predominant. And a lot of the office work that got automated quickly was seen as women's work, of course, services, uh, people bank telling, secretarial work, etc. And even when socialism was trying to create the modern woman, uh, its own magazine, Janata Dnes, which was, had a huge circulation, was actually became this venue of criticism of Bulgarian computing because it's not actually freeing women out of anything. Um, it's actually adding to their burden. And I'm happy to talk more about that, but there's definitely much more work to be done here, not just in the Bulgarian case, but I feel in all Eastern Bloc, uh, gender dimension of computing. Um, there's an explosion in culture. Bulgaria might be the biggest producer of electronics in Eastern Bloc, but it's definitely the biggest producer in the world of robotic loans per capita. It produces new rob robotic laws um, by philosophers and science fiction writers, which, as you can see, uh, which the fourth states a robot must establish its identity as a robot in all its cases. And the fifth one says a robot must know it's a robot. And I think they speak a lot to both anxieties about what will happen when we're working alongside machines all the time and maybe there'll be a merging of identities. But also the fifth law is actually fairly optimistic that if we consider ourselves as a robot, maybe we can live to learn in this machine age. And I think these philosophical and literature implications um, have a lot, obviously, to say about today's world, but we can talk more about them too. Um, finally, there is a moment that towards the end of the book where I want to trace exactly the transition period. And the fact that if you divide this, it's a tripartite division in many ways in this economy of what we're talking about. Hundreds of the majority of the 200,000 workers were workers on the conveyor belt. These are the workers who, in many ways, are the, 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 got the industrialized, right? There's also the tens of thousands of well trained engineers who kind of work in the me middle management, but then there's also a cadre of at least 12 to 20 people who are the highest levels the factory directors and the people who control Bulgarian technology and science. And again, I'm happy to expand more of these, but some of those people we interview and some of the people who are the top make these transitions to the 90s very well. You know, some of them end up in high positions in governments and, and high positions in some of the first Bulgarian businesses, especially businesses such as Multigroup. Multigroup is um, probably how best to say them, an insurance and mafia empire, which is what probably the biggest company in Bulgaria in the 90s. And that transition, of course, I think only gets made so easily precisely because of these people's not so much computer knowledge, but business connections forged around the need to produce computers. And I want to end on maybe the final generation that makes that transition very well, and that's the children. Since 1983-1984, Bulgarian schools are teaching computers, and Bulgarian computer clubs spring up. There's over 500 in the country run by the Communist Youth Network by the late 80s, and children, Bulgarian children, basically become maybe the last successful export of this industry. 
not because not only because many of them i think did actually make a transition to both the capitalist and the bulgarian silicon valley in the 90s but also because they, they were the biggest producers of viruses in the world and you know by the 90s about one third of all ibm viruses were made in bulgaria and there's this like famous or like world famous at that point virus makers that come out of this country and i think that is probably in many ways the final kind of in the kind of if i don't know uh explosion of this industry but also i think it's a good way to see that really what survives of this industry is the human capital because and we can talk more about this this what happens in the 1990s is deindustrialization really and what bulgaria produces now in this sector is not hardware it's software and it's much fewer people are participating in it than they did in the late 80s. Um, and because it's been half an hour and because I'm super, I was super late, I think maybe it's best to stop here and because the PowerPoint is not working and because in some ways I think I've demonstrated the failure of Bulgarian computing on a, on, on a meta level, I think it's probably, I'll just put it into it here. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we continue with a commentary by Vedran Duancic from the University of Klagenfurt. Who has to unmute yourself? yourself? <laughs> I'm there, I'm there. Hi, hi everyone. Hi, Victor. Um, great. Uh, it's really been a while since I last made so many uh, comments in, in Margine uh, while reading a book. Uh, I sometimes do quarrel with the author of the book uh, in Margine. I know it's st stupid, but this time it, it wasn't for a quarrel. It was for um, marking uh, uh, new information, insightful conclusions, and uh, an occasional um, well-placed sarcastic comment. So um, <laughs> the style didn't um, didn't escape. I'll bring my pen because I want to I want to note down the sarcastic comments. So that's okay. No, no, okay. <laughs> sure. So this is really um, a wonderful case study uh, by me by which I first mean Bulgaria. Uh, Victor uh, more than computers. Uh, Victor briefly spoke about that. Um, we're living through. Um, a wave of like a small renaissance or in Eastern European socialist studies, uh, socialism goes global, etc. Yet, if you actually count the number of times Bulgaria is mentioned in most of the overviews, uh, less um, less knowledgeable readers will be perfectly like excused for not knowing that there was a socialist uh, Bulgaria. So, um, together with the recent uh, book by Drostino. Um, um, this will definitely, this will definitely help that. And, and coming from a Yugoslav context, uh, the fact that the history of Yugoslavia ha was predominant in the in the Balkan context for a, for a long time didn't help. Uh, didn't help either. Um, I really love that this is a national history, though though in a in a new way um, where national and global meet and where the global condition, so to say, is taken is taken seriously. Uh, this is basically something that, I mean, I like it because I like to, <laughs> to think that I do something like that in my, um, uh, in my research. So kind of you know, bringing the national and the global in a sort of dialectical re relationship um, uh, where, you know, the national is informed uh, through, uh, through um, awareness of the globe, of the globe. And it really is quite a uh, quite a case study uh, from the perspective of um, history of of technology. I mean, um, a fantastic uh, leap forward in just uh, in just um, one generation. Basically, you know, a country in, which is in popular imagination more often associated with mountains or cheese here appears you know, as the IT center of the second world, um, uh, presented in a way that kind of might necessitate a rethinking of the answer to the to the you know maybe a common question in exams you know what is the hierarchy what what were the most technically and scientifically advanced countries of East, uh, of the eastern bloc for instance you know? obviously soviet union then we can go to the East, eastern germany and then you know the, why don't we stop the list there basically you know? um there is there are obvious connections, and I mean this in a really good um, sense um, to the work by uh, Ben uh, and Uslan, of course, he is here. Um, kind of, I, I loved how I recognized the, the, 
the old story and how you how you brought the story forward, not only to different um, different um, uh, case study, but uh, it's developing somewhere. And uh, basically, whatever I say can only be you know, informed by my research in a similar thing, less focused on on computers. This was happening several hundred kilometers to the west uh, from uh, Bulgaria, that is in socialist Yugoslavia, and I was. I didn't think I would be reading the book so intently, but then I ended up because it was a wonderful exercise in comparative history, where I was finding incredible uh, similarities. Basically, if you if you slightly tweaked someone's name, Popov to Popovic, it could be perfectly the same uh, thing. And then two sentences later, where you, you would expect a certain similarity, then the answer would be like, completely different to the more or less uh, um, uh, same uh, same problem or question. So I really liked you know, this, uh, I mean, for me at least uh, personally, the opportunity uh, of a comparative uh, a comparative reading. And when I was starting to um, to read the book, in the, I was honestly expecting um, the, the other three, seven, 25 competing factions be it within you know the party or from the other republic um, um, obstructing pop-ups or someone else's um, um, uh, plan so from you know from a different republic from a different institute from, from a different faction of the party and then it, it really took me a while to to re you know, to, to forget the context I'm research wise coming from there is something really beautiful about the small the small state. Um, it's obviously the no, um, not a new concept in uh, in, uh, in the history of science, but again, uh, um, since you, you you don't explicitly you don't elaborate it on a, a lot, it's it's there all the time in the background, and it took me a while to to really figure out how how different the the structure of the country, <laughs> the absence of multiple uh, multiple uh, competing uh, centers uh, can actually help. Um, uh, in that, in that sense. and of course the timing, right? And um, in chapter, I think two, the captive uh, captive market, you do a really great job of explaining how and why such a, such a success was possible. You know, it's a it couldn't have have. Uh, maybe my question would be, could it have happened five years before or five years later? In my reading of your book, no. But then it brings me to the to the to the comparison which you mentioned briefly several times in the book, twice or three times, and that's the case of East Germany, which in in the literature thus far was probably much much um, uh, better known. Uh, and if we ask the question in a more contemporary manner, you know, is it smart? Is it a good investment to bet on massive in, um, in investments in technology as a way of accelerating economic development? You know, is Bulgaria a potential model or simply a unique historical example, difficult or impossible to replicate outside of those very specific um, context in which, uh, in which it happened? You know, everyone, every policy, every Minister of Technology, Education, or whatever is is um, is playing the same, uh, beating the same drum of obviously technological investments. I mean, in a way, do you want to become a new socialist Bulgaria, like an unlikely success story? Well, statistically, you're more likely to end up as you know the socialist East Germany. <laughs> in a way, again, you know, the the potential of success as as an exception, uh, something historically unique or a potential, uh, a potential for a model. And this kind of brings me, it reminds me of the book by Margaret O'Mara um, about the, 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 um, the attempts to replicate Stanford model uh, um, outside, outside Stanford. I, you have something that you proclaim to be a model that seems to work beautifully kind of forget about the historical contingency around the supposed model and, you know, is it a model or simply a, um, something that's difficult to, uh, to, re to replicate? Um, 
maybe the question could be re, um, re, um, rephrased in terms of structure and agency. Uh, that's something I think Ben Peters also touches upon in his book from several years ago. Um, you, Bulgarians are not creating the conditions, but they are using and navigating the conditions very, very well. So, you know, what comes first to what side of the of the um, uh, imaginary um, um, dichotomy uh, would a story would a story win? And I usually ask my students, what kind of a narrative is this? They hate the question; it's obviously too big. But what kind of a narrative your book book brings? And it's a it's a really triumphant, positive, up, <laughs> uplifting narrative. To the point, when if if uh, and, and this is now a slight critique, if you were if you weren't aware of the the macroeconomic um, of the macroeconomic um, uh, uh, trends, uh, you would be forgiven for think for mistaking Bulgaria for uh, an exceptionally well functioning economy. Part of the reason is. You know, lies in in the methodological choice. You did you chose well, obviously, uh, uh, going with kind of internalist institutional uh, history. Um, but then, from their perspective, it's a, it it really is objectively is a great story. And then, kind of, it is a story of computing. IT industry in Bulgaria, but not necessarily in in Bulgaria. In the context of you know, you you talk a little about what are the effects of automatization, etc., in stores in wider economy. But you know, it's it's one of the classic STS teaching, uh, basically cliches to ask you know to to juxtapose Silicon Valley and a uh, place fifty kilometers away where there is no internet, which is you know technological desert. Uh, so kind of this, you know, basically what's on the cover? It's the it's the it's the two worlds coexisting, and in terms of you know one of the worlds is uh, is. Um, obviously, less um, uh, less uh, represented. Can, can I hint to uh, to problems. Uh, that's what that's part of the sarcastic uh, uh, register. Oh, it was going going great, and then in brackets you say, but it wasn't really. <laughs> Which I kind of liked, <laughs> but again because. Probably everyone uh, at the Zoom talk uh, uh, knew the background for people without that uh, that, that knowledge. It might be uh, more, more difficult uh, to decipher. So it's is it's at the same time I read it as a story of uh, of a lag and being too advanced. The perpetual lag, obviously, in comparison with the more uh, developed uh, economies, technologically. Attempts to uh, to catch up. Successes partially through you know. Whatever through um, um, reverse engineering, local ingenuity, good timing, uh, fostering good uh, international connections, etc. But also, which you refer briefly, and it would be great to hear more about, kind of being simply too advanced for for the local economy. Parts of the parts of the great successes were difficult to um, uh, uh, simply to implement. I'm because I was reading the book together uh, at the same time as I was going through the notes of um, uh, Daniel's and Krieger's book, uh, Knowledge, Regulation, and National Security in, in Cold War America, since whatever the, the title is. I noticed an interesting kind of interpretation that you, you claim in several uh, places, several times that. Bulgaria was able to basically, in a way, cheat the you know the the COCOM, the 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 the, um, the the block division in a way. No, read against the background of their book, it's kind of it's a more more uh, less optimist interpretation that I would like to offer. It's basically no, they didn't. If if I'm reading their book right like, um, correctly um, in comparison to your book. Actually, the the trade um, uh, trade uh, and um, knowledge knowledge flow regulations from 1970s were doing precisely what they were meant to do: simply protect the lead of the U.S. and the narrow circle of of advanced economies 
from everyone else, basically. So this is kind of, in a way, and this brings me to the, my central point. This is not necessarily a story of um, of, of emancipation, but story of perpetually being locked in in the global division of labor, not dictated global, so not on you know, socialist in terms of um, uh, uh, Eastern Bloc, uh, but the global division of labor dictated by growingly since 1970s uh, by um, uh, by capitalism. You know? So I'm gonna. My central point is um, I'm going to ask it from the perspective of a devil's advocate, you know, in a way, but also from someone who, having spent a lot of time um, with a relatable, similar type of free, uh, sources and thinking about, you know, what does it all mean, is me I'm maybe experiencing a slight crisis of of faith. So I, I was, you know, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna use you as a, um, uh, reconvince me if you could. Um, what am I talking about? First, we abandoned the diffusionist model of knowledge uh, um, transfers. We reconceptualized circulation of knowledge, people, um, objects. Then we decentralized the formerly, you know, very heavily Eurocentric narrative. You know, science is universal, but uh, Europe is its uh, home, etc. Then we reconceptualized. The, the Cold War, the Iron Curtain, the Second in the World, and, third, and, and, um, and the Global South, and we've, we've, we've been seeing a real flood of great case studies uh, in South South Exchange, which is probably, you know, to a certain degree, what we want to see, like generationally, and it's a, it's a reflection of um, political biases of a lot of us, um, you know, that you want to see the, the emancipatory story that breaks the, the logic of, of, um, uh, of global capital that we live um, through. And then there, are, there were great, of course, obviously examples of you know, this horizontal exchange leading to great things. But when I'm reading my sources, and when I was reading part of your, your story, it's gonna, it, it's almost inviting me to be sympathetic to the efforts of people who spent years and years developing a certain project, trying to, to place it somewhere in a developing world, and then, you know, being simply undercut by, you name it, IBM or anyone else. That didn't happen all, all the time, of course. Kind of how easy, how how fragile, how ephemer ephemeral uh, the successes were in this, you know, in in attempts to uh, to um, break the the chains of uh, of globalization that um, that, that are very noticeable, um, explicitly as well implicitly uh, uh, throughout your uh, your books. So you kind of, you, at the end, you, you, you speak of two narratives, one nostalgic, but second, which kind of maybe we tend to dismiss because we know it comes with a lot of anti-socialist bias. It's basically, oh, where, where could we have been were it not for socialism, you know? We'd, and time and again, especially in Bulgarian case, I, Greece would be posited as the alternative to to the um, to the uh, uh, to the Bulgarian case. When we kind of, I'm a, I'm, I'm acting as as a devil's advocate here, and then I'm going to end. <laughs> if we were to indulge that line of kind of thinking, so is a is a story is it a story of a great success or a story of a, like a, a simply bowing to the logic of the market and giving up on socialism well before the socialism ended you have toward the toward the end of the of the um, of the uh, conclusion a great uh, sentence the second world constituted itself as an alternative modernity where socialist states could in some ways start from scratch but the industrial um Horizons often remained Western, etc. So, kind of, I'm, I would be interested in more about this, um, the emancipatory promise and effects that the story, that uh, that your case story, um, case story, kind of brings us. 
last we really think in what context i'm kind of more and more there's something very pro problematic in the, in the good sense tempting um with david edgerton's um comment on and in the quote whenever technology is involved in discussions of the notion or globalization um, remember that it is very possible that it is not technology which is doing the explaining, but an account of, techn of technology which should have been discredited a long time ago. So again, you know, how do we square all of this? <laughs> this is I know this is a silly question, but I'm I'm interested in in really the the the, um, the emancipatory promise and effects of, uh, of of history and i'm interested in, in that for very selfish reasons because i'm i'm looking from the other side of the border at something very similar that's you know not always as progressive as it claimed to be or as we like to remember it to have been thanks um warmly recommended the book yeah thank you very much uh and i would Maybe start by Victor, like five minutes reaction, uh, not longer. Mm -hmm. And then we can open the floor. And if there is no questions, then you can kind of come back to, to veterans comments and questions. Oh, thank you. This is, first of all, thank you for the warm word. Uh, <laughs> it's always nice to hear nice things. Uh, you can send email to my mom if you want. Uh, but uh, there's, um, I mean, I think uh, there all your comments and questions, I think, as you say, like kind of like circle around what kind of story it is and whether it's a success. And I think, yeah, I mean, like the easy cop out answer is, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's the question is for who? It's always has to be for who and which structure, right? I don't think that I think I agree, like that um, I hide my hand somewhat in a couple of anecdotes towards the end. Like it is not an emancipatory project if you think of it as um, in a global sense, because of course, Precisely what's happening is um, Bulgaria and the Soviet bloc is catching up. And I think it's baked from its very technological decisions in this specific case with the unified system. You know, if you're going to be copying IBM, you're always going to be behind IBM. Right. So that's, uh, you know, there could there was another possibility in the 60s where, you know, the Bulgarians were basing it on Fujitsu. Poland was doing its older series. Like there was, there were potentially to be like maybe like some kind of competition without, within the bloc in some ways, of which was kind of like destroyed in the 60s. And that's where I think the answer changes because the structure is the Comic-Con structure, and that's where the Bulgarians are competing, and that's where there's emancipation. I think computers are one of the ways that Bulgaria emancipates itself from its agricultural positions and plunges way above its weight than, that it should, right? So that, you know, it wags, the, it wag, the tail wags the dog, right? So Zhivkov in the 70s says that Bulgaria has the biggest colony in the world, the Soviet Union. And I think that he's not lying in that sense, right? You know, low resources are coming in, Bulgaria is sending te high technology products, which are quite often inferior. So I think that answers somewhat the question also, for example, why I think the social intelligence, the scientific intelligence story is a success because the Bulgarian, COCOM did what it did, but the Bulgarian competition wasn't with the Americans, the Bulgarian competition was the Poles and the Hungarians and these Germans, right? And it seemed that somehow they managed to buy a lot of investment and shrewd specialization in just one or two places, they managed to outcompete those people. Because so that's why it could only it was only success within the logics of socialist economic of the global socialist economy. I would never call it a success in the global economy in a material sense. What I would call it is a success if you take the lens off the computer and move it to the people. Because in many ways, in the end of the day, that's what I started the preface. It's a story about the people and their worlds. And I feel that this the creation of this technological class is where the success story is because they managed to. A, a, work in quite different worlds than lots of the actual computers themselves, if you know what I mean. Like the computers might the, the might be tied to this competition with the West and they're always behind it, but the people necessarily aren't, right? The people's ideas aren't, which I think um it, I would agree with you. Yes, that's why there's both an uneven development in the country and why there is also a collapse of socialism way before socialism even collapses in the minds of a certain cadre of reform, reformist minded people, which I talked about in the last chapter. And that's where I would argue with you, or not with you, but with this argument that there is actually competition, it's actually towards the end. There is like, that's when the factionalism arises because there's enough, there's a second generation of Bulgarian technical experts who are born after the war usually, or at least have grown up after the war and are not so tied to Moscow, they're tied to ideas which are coming from somewhere else. And they're saying socialism can be reformed 
they have to be formed towards oh glasnos before glasnos you know so that's where the, so those people would say whether you want to say success or not it's a success for them right? it's a success for who success for them because it allows them to develop ideas and business connections and financial connections and a technological language which allows them to um challenge the geriatric kind of Politburo by the 80s, right? And they kind of lose in 1988, they get kind of kicked out of the Politburo and then they come back with a vengeance after 1989. So um, it's, and for who obviously it's when you when you widen out, it's exactly about the state and the, it, this is not a success story. Like I think I mentioned this, the Bulgarian Plovdiv is one where the second biggest electronics factory in Bulgaria is made 30 kilometers away. A, a village wasn't electrified until 1989. Right, but of course, since that is why that cover, which some people have said is self-orientalizing, maybe it is self-orientalizing, but it is, it, I think it captures that story, right? This is a state which had very limited resources and made a very specific choice because of the specific conditions of competing with these Germans for the Soviet markets, let's say. And that meant quite often that the states looks like the Silicon Valley, whatever you want to call it, high tech success story, if you're already in specific factory floors and then you, when you leave it, it doesn't look like a success story at all and that is and it's it plays out within the industry itself when you the engineers that they interviewed have an absolutely um this horrible view of their workers right the way they talk about the workers maybe because because they they, they feel like of course we're not catching up to the west but also our technology like it's shoddy not because we're only reverse engineering it but it's not being put together and that's when they start insulting the rest of the bulgarian society bulgarian society is not catching up to us right Bulgarian peasant, Bulgarian workers smell of peppers. I think mean, that's one of the most the quotes that really stuck with me because these people are just have been taken off the land and are now sweating all over my wonderful components. Um, I'm not well, basically my main my main argument for you would be it's a success. It only makes sense when you think of the Bulgarians not as trying to emancipate themselves from the world, but from this, from their co-compositions. That is where the success is. It's a success for who? And should anyone copy Bulgarian? No. <laughs> uh, should anyone copy them? Because um, Bulgarians by the 80s, they completely understand that reverse engineering is some, they've basically only captured, it goes back to your first question, this can only have happened at that precise moment in the 60s because everybody was kind of on a level playing field in the Eastern Bloc. If it was five years later, I don't think Bulgaria would have ever been able to overcome the checks of the East Germans and capture the Soviet markets. Um, if it happened five years earlier, Bulgaria probably would not have been able to break through COCOM at precisely the same way. Uh, and in many ways, I think the failure story, the failure aspect of this is precisely in the 80s, is a it is time to make the next evolutionary jump in computers for the Bulgarians. And that's when they realize, oh, now we are on a level playing field. We might cap, cap, hold half the market, but fundamentally, we're not different to these German or Czechoslovaks or the Soviets in technological capabilities. And this would take so much more financing and so much more thinking change change of thinking that we are basically going to have to bankrupt ourselves and i think it directly bankrupts it um i'm still thinking because th these are big questions right uh these are very big questions in that sense uh and um i wouldn't and my my thinking is that while it's been a global story what the bulgarians are doing on the global stage is not what they're doing what what they made that industry for i think once they've made it they start trying to use it for that and it never really works uh, if you look at finances, it, financially, it's a it's a failure on the global stage. But I think if you shift the thing to technology and to intellectual intellectual ideas, that's where the fertility comes with. And I think elements of these Bulgarian intellectuals, maybe not so much the directors of the factories, but the engineers and the philosophers who thought about it, cybernetics, their futures, while they were they failed, were actually quite emancipatory. The things I talk about in chapter five and six, I think obviously they're very like highfalutin and. But um, they, they, they are in some ways also anti-party because, of course, what are you going to do in a, in, with the dictatorship of the proletariat if the proletariat is automated? But I don't know. I'm just uh, grasping for things here. Um, they're very good questions. I need to really think more about them. Maybe, maybe in a second book. We have a question. Jan, will you? Exactly. So, so basically, everybody who wants to ask a question from the public, please uh, raise your hand or uh, write a queue uh, in the chat. Uh, you can also write a question in the chat, but then I nevertheless have to read it. Uh, and we have a first question from uh, from Katrin Heilman. 
Uh, I had a question linked to the point on the influence of Western economic achievement as a benchmark for Bulgarian industries. The Albanian-Chinese relationship is often cited as an example for an exceptional foreign policy decision. You mentioned Japan as an alternative model that licensed some designs. What about China in the late 1970s under reform and opening? Yeah, China features surprisingly little in the both the archives and the memoirs and interviews, I feel. I feel like the Bulgarians maybe either didn't know much about China, but also it seems like uh, it's not, it wasn't the place to copy or to find, uh, um, to, they didn't see it as comparable in the sense of both technology level at that particular point and also as a mo model. I think what they liked in the Japanese model and the second country that really pops up in the 80s is Singapore. So there is an obsession with Asian economies, but it's these two precise economies, never China, really. Uh, the Bulgarians, I think, seeing them um, better reverse engineers, maybe because they've been reverse engineering by the 50s, from the 50s and 60s, and also a model for small countries. Of course, not. I don't know why in the Bulgarian mindset Japan was a model for small countries, but Singapore was suddenly became in the 80s this explode this this thing that really dominated Bulgarian thinking about how a small country could become an electronics exporter uh, from on a more successful level. Yeah, I really see the Japanese thing as the obsession down to the 80s. And I think that was a, a, as a policy decision that it captured the imagination of Zhivkov, the communist leader himself, and been that carried over. But also Japan is where the heads of Bulgarian, the Bulgarian economics and science after 1974 were drawn from. The ex-ambassador was put as in charge of, of um, uh, science policy and the ex-trade attaché was actually eventually became the economic czar between 1977 and 1988. Um, and actually the robotics main robotics expert eventually becomes ambassador to Japan in the 80s. I think just Japan was somehow both the cadres were fascinated with it and the cadres were drawn from there. And that's, it just, maybe that's path dependency. The first engineers would, so China just like drops off the, the ideas and Bulgaria doesn't even try to export to China very much in computers at that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so the further questions. Well, I think that's, that's always a problem when, when the book and presentation are kind of uh, very thick and overwhelming, then it's very hard to... Uh, we have Slava. Yeah, hi. Uh, so thank you, Victor, for a very interesting presentation and fascinating work. Um, I wonder, uh, so you mentioned the kind of a, uh, maybe a reformist impulse among these technological experts. Um, but uh, you could also, you know, see them as an elite group, which is invested in the re political regimes that creates their the privileged position. So uh, do you see that kind of attention in these two kind of drives? Do you see that community kind of split in a way? Or do you see that kind of tension inside essentially every expert uh, fighting for various conflicting goals? Yeah, it's, uh, I think in their head, it's, it's a great question. I think they had reform and the regime persevering are go hand in hand. So I think by the 80s, a lot of these people who are, I said come a lot from Japan are seemingly aware that the regime cannot progress economically, at least if there is no some reform. And actually, Sometimes it's based on particular uh, obvious um, personal reasons, not only because obviously they're the directors of the factories, but because they're not getting paid as much, let's say, the cultural, cultural intelligentsia. I don't know how it was in the Soviet Union, but the Bulgarian cultural intelligentsia, especially in the 70s and 80s, this things that the Drag Dragostinova talks about, was ruled so perfectly that um, basically Bulgarian engineers and the people who championed them felt that they were, you know, they were the people who were building the economy of the country were being paid like 10% of what the writers and the philosophers were being paid. And actually in the 80s, these people who are the head of the economy and are pushing for reform are trying to create and manage to create industrial associations within Bulgaria based on Japanese and Swedish models and are precisely saying that we need, you, you need, you, stop, you should stop listening and stop concentrating so much on this like cultural offensive and these kind of things and listen to the actual people who are building the technology. Um, of course, I wouldn't say that they're pushing for democracy. They're pushing definitely for some kind of democratic socialism in their, whatever they're perceiving it. But actually, well, well, I don't know what, in some, some of them are pushing for like more democratic, you know, that means in their idea, that really means only cooperation with Western companies, not so, not so much the Western ideas of, you know, mass media, free media, et cetera. Um, 
I think what the real division in the reformist group is there's two modernizing factions and one of them is tied to let's reform the economy and let's reform it based on maybe let's say state-led capitalist models or maybe let's copy the Japanese model completely create silent cities but never obviously give up the party power and the other one obviously doesn't want to give it the party power, but is much more tied to let's keep exploiting Moscow's financing until the end. And they're also they're also the second generation. And I think they're the ones who in 1988, 1989 managed to win over the previous and kick them out of the Politburo. But as communism collapses, the other faction comes back uh, more and more in the economics. So I think that there is definitely a... I, I think just that there, for them, there's no contradiction between reform and maintaining the elite status. I think they, they're very much aware that the elite status will not be maintained, or maybe they don't even have the elite status yet. <laughs> if, uh, yeah, so I think in the 60s, there was much more consensus. But in the 60s, this group didn't exist yet, it seemed to me. Right? It was created around this industry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, still searching for further questions. Uh, or maybe whether you have some questions from your comment which remained unanswered. And if there are no questions, then uh, I would herewith conclude the, the meeting. Uh, I suppose that there will be some questions which you will get then as an email, or will you you will read them in the reviews of the book. Thank uh, you. Yeah, so thank you once more uh, for being here with us. Uh, thank you, Vedran, for commenting. Uh, and thank you everyone for uh, for listening, for coming and uh, making us believe that uh, as a format, book talks on Zoom still can work even after pandemic. So thank you very much and have a great uh, evening, morning, depending on where you are, night. <laughs> thank you.